Well, welcome to the Backyard Professor videos. I want to finish this idea that I began using Margaret Barker on her idea of secret, hidden teachings and traditions of Jesus and what some of these hidden traditions could have meant to the early Christians. Uh, in her book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, on page 4 and 5, I'll just I'll briefly discuss this and uh, call up a day. <laughs> her question, she asks, is very pertinent. Where did Jesus see these secret things, that these, these hierarchies, principalities, angels, etc., that the early Christian fathers seemed very much aware of, but that were not written down in the Bible record? This was strictly a hidden oral tradition. Well, the earliest Christian writings, she notes, suggest that this was the temple tradition, that what Jesus saw was a vision in the Holy of Holies. Now, this is remarkable. Consider the ramifications of this. If Jesus saw this information in the Holy of Holies, in other words, the point is that Jesus himself was initiated into the tradition of the high priesthood. Clement of Alexandria distinguished between the true and false teachers by saying that the false make perverse use of the divine words. They do not enter in as we enter in through the tradition of the Lord by drawing aside the curtain. Now that's Clement of Alexandria, a very important early Christian father in his miscellanies. Drawing aside the curtain implies entering the Holy of Holies in the temple. The presence of God. Only the high priest ever did this. Well, Ignatius of Antioch, writing earlier in the 2nd century B.C., he knew how Jesus had acquired the secret teachings. Here's what he says. To Jesus alone, as our high priest, were the secret things of God committed. Jesus knew the secret teaching because he was a high priest. Were these early authors the only evidence we had, we could prove very little. However, the picture of Jesus as the great high priest in all his roles and aspects appears throughout the New Testament. And in fact, it is this knowledge that is the key to understanding all of the early Christian teaching about Jesus. <laughs> now, now, see, this is a a very interesting point of view she's bringing out. Contemporary beliefs about the role of the high priest became the basis for the proclamation of who Jesus was and what he had accomplished by both his death and his resurrection. It's important to consider all the early evidence for Jesus. Considered piecemeal, there is bound to be distortion, of course. In addition to the New Testament Gospels, we have to take into account the writings of the first Christians. And all of these must be treated with respect, and the evidence they offer pieces together to reconstruct Jesus as he was. It is, however, unwise to label the early writings as heretical just because they do not conform to later beliefs. See... This is interesting. The, the beliefs may not be the same as time goes by, but that's not proof that the early Christian writings were heretical while the later Orthodox writings were correct. That's what she's saying, essentially. She's saying, let's explore all the evidence, which I absolutely cannot disagree with her in any manner. This is the essence of what we have to do with all of the scriptures. Whether it's the pearl of great price, using all the evidence of the various Abraham materials for the book of Abraham, the various Enoch materials for the Enoch sections in the book of Moses, the various Moses materials on the book of Moses, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi writings, the early Christians, we must assess all of the evidence and all of the surrounding cultural evidence to get a fullest presumably more correct, picture of things. Watch what happens when Margaret Barker does this with Jesus as the high priest. This is utterly remarkable. <laughs> I love this kind of stuff. Many of the so-called Gnostic texts, for example, preserve real memories of Jesus. Oh, and they do. I mean, that's, that's established at this point. 
and many of the difficulties encountered in the quest for the real Jesus are difficulties of our own making. If we only accept as evidence the writings which depict Jesus as a teacher or as a faith healer, then of course it will be difficult to explain how he came to be worshipped as the Messiah and as the Son of God. Yes, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Nor is it wise to be too certain about the context in which Jesus preached. The fact that the Qumran texts, and she's talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls here, not only illuminated, but they radically altered our picture of first century Palestine, shows us how inaccurate our picture of early Palestine had been. And yet this traditional picture is still the context of much of the New Testament interpretation. There's new light on the horizon, and we need to begin incorporating that new light instead of a traditional understanding. Now watch what happens to Jesus in a most stunning manner as she incorporates this new light. This is really... I mean, she reminds me so much of Hugh Nibley's writings here and the Nilay Maxwell Institute. What she does here is so good. The figure who emerges from a more broadly based reconstruction is far from just a teacher or a miracle worker. He is the great high priest. Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. The Qumran Melchizedek text, the 11Q Melchizedek, of which I've gathered an enormous amount of materials and of which I do want to make some videos on. I started, but I never finished them. This text shows that this was the figure, the great high priest, was the figure who was expected to appear in the first week of the 10th Jubilee to teach about the end of the age. That matches to rescue the children of light from the power of Satan, to set people free from the debt of iniquity, to establish the kingdom of God, and to perform the great atonement sacrifice of the last days. This is the Dead Sea Scroll text that talks about the great high priest who will come and do this for Israel. <laughs> Hang on, she's not done yet. It's been fashionable to cast a wide net throughout the ancient Mediterranean world to find explanations for the earliest Christian claims about Jesus. Pagan ideas, for instance, apparently were incorporated into the new faith by Greek converts. This is one way of trying to establish who Jesus was. Well, of course, they just adapted paganism, you know. This is freaking Gandhi's uh, idea of the mysteries of Jesus and so on and so forth. Christianity, oh, she, it's just a pagan religion. But hold on now. Hold on. There's another option. A very intriguing option. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are our hint. <laughs> ah, this is fun. The explanation of pagan origins is not necessary. And, it, and it's not. Everything that was claimed for Jesus was part of the established belief about the great high priest in Israel. And we need look no further. According to the traditional reckoning, Jesus appeared when Melchizedek was expected to appear. He was baptized in the first week of the 10th Jubilee, just exactly like that Dead Sea Scroll Melchizedek text said he should be. And he claimed to have fulfilled the Jubilee prophecy in Isaiah 61, which was associated with Melchizedek. And Jesus read that out loud to the people, and he said, This day the scripture is fulfilled. That's in uh, Luke 4.21. Well, we can be certain that the first Hebrew Christians in Palestine knew about the high priests, of course. The fundamentals of the faith proclaimed from the very beginning were all rooted in contemporary beliefs about the anointed high priest. The anointed high priest. Nor is there any need to suggest that the first Christians pieced together a whole variety of variegated ideas and created for the first time a composite figure who they then declared Jesus to be. That's not necessary to proclaim that either. Not at all. The essence of their preaching was that Jesus fulfilled 
fully all the expectations. He was the one they had been waiting for. And the Qumran Melchizedek text shows that the one they were waiting for was the high priest. The letter to the Hebrews, even if we cannot be certain who these Hebrews Christians were, this describes Christ, Jesus, as their great high priest, Hebrews 4.14. Fulfilling the ancient rites of the temple and offering himself as the great atoning sacrifice. That's Hebrews 9, 1-28. Well, Jesus even spoke of himself as the heavenly high priest. Now notice how Barker connects this. This, in my opinion, is utterly brilliant. Jesus himself spoke as the heavenly high priest. That was his self-understanding. And here's why. Whom the Father consecrates and sent into the world. John 10, 36. You say, huh? <laughs> that tells you Jesus thought he was the great high priest? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it does. Here's why. The expectation, the understanding and knowledge of how a high priest became the high priest and the role that the high priest was performing throughout the long concourses of history in Israel, the fact is, consecrate, the word consecrate, is a technical term here. It's used in Leviticus 8 and 12 for making the high priest. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> Whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world. The technical term for consecrate in the Old Testament, in Israel's class, was a consecration. The evidence even at this great distance in time fits perfectly. <laughs> You know that, and this is on page four and five. I mean, this is right at the front of her book. And once she establishes the premise this way, and once she demonstrates the uh, the overarching significance, not only just for the early Christians, whether they were Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians, but the idea is this tradition reaches back further behind Jesus' day, way off all the way down through the Dead Sea Scrolls, and before them into ancient Israel to Isaiah, and before him stretching all the way back through the various kings and judges, all the way back to Aaron and Moses, when Aaron and Moses were consecrated in Israel for that leadership position, Moses being the high priest also. Jesus absolutely fits beautifully within that tradition going back, way back, into ancient Israel. And that is the tradition that the Jews, whether openly or secretly among themselves, I'm sure there were times, you know, like, well, when the Babylonians, when the Babylonians came in and wiped out Jerusalem, 600 B.C. and all that jazz, I'm sure some of the information had to go underground, but it was never lost track of. Israel knew what they were looking for the great high priest. Jesus came as that great high priest, the high priest, of course, taking the blood of the atonement sacrifice, the animal, and spilling it on the altar, shedding the blood for the atonement for the people. That was a famous atonement, right, using the, the sacrificing of animals. Jesus himself, according to Hebrews, went into the temple and shed his own blood for the atonement of sins. He took the place of the sacrificial animal. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I, I, I mean, this is just phenomenal. <laughs> this is the tradition of ancient Israel. And this is the self-understanding of Jesus about his mission. It doesn't have to be discovered through a, a Gentile pagan, Mediterranean sort of a god who, who dies and is resurrected. It's not paganism at all. It goes back right to the first temple tradition and before. It was established exactly at the beginning of Israel. And it's been there all the way through. A fascinating picture, isn't it? So, 
when you when you see the ideas of uh, oh Jesus Christianity it just adapted a bunch of paganism well the fact is Christianity was very syncretistic and that word is a is a scholarly word meaning a syncretism is an adapting of other uh, ideas doctrines and so forth to make sense of your own religion of your neighbor's religion etc Christianity did adapt a lot to be sure but that wasn't the origin. That was added on to the core idea of the great high priest, which absolutely is anchored in Israelite understanding. And that's fascinating. That is the projection pew, through the Israelite themes and beliefs. That is the projection that Jesus came through. It wasn't an adaptation of paganism. No. You don't have to leave Israel to get the full concentration of themes of who Jesus was, what he was, and what he did. It's in Israel. You don't have to go to outside sources that has no idea at all of what Israel's themes were. That's fine. And, and Barker, you know, her book's 500 pages. I mean, the thing is a mammoth text. It's a wonderful read. She has another book, The Great High Priest, that will absolutely knock your socks off if I can get to it. Here's my suspicion. This next year, we're going to be studying the Book of Mormon. Now, I started the Book of Mormon commentary uh, a few years ago, and I never got very far. I did like 80 videos or something like that, and I think I only got through the first five or six chapters of 1 Nephi. So instead of doing such a detailed commentary, unless, of course, you guys want me to, if you find that it helped you, I think I'm going to pick up with the Book of Mormon again, and the sirens of the Pearl of Great Price are beginning to call me back also. Uh, I, I come and go and come and go with that. You know, the, the critics now these days with the papyri, they have nitpicked so tiny, minuscule of details and they're so worried over just small splotches of ink on the papyri and all that that I, I think they've lost the forest for the trees. And the LDS apologists, everybody's been running over there trying to worry about answering the critics and I think we've lost the broad picture at this point. I may very well start a series on the uh, Book of Abraham again and the Book of Moses and the Book of Enoch and the Books of Adam uh, I mean, the Pearl of Great Price is just stunning. There's tens of thousands of wonderful pages of ideas on the uh, Pearl of Great Price. I may jump on that, too, so I may be doing a double whammy this next year, and it's going to keep me mighty, mighty busy. So, anyway, that's my intention. So, thanks for watching my videos, and I will see you in the next video.